The following program is a videotape production of the Maine Public Broadcasting Network. humorist lecturer Mark Twain gave one of his lectures in Maine and through this whole very humorous routine he noticed that nobody was laughing and he left that hall thinking that he'd been a complete failure as a humorist but on the way out he overheard a farmer telling his wife he said to a Bessie you know that man was so funny I had all I could do to keep him laughing I know how that old farmer felt the other night when Henry Hatch dropped in. That's pretty good. Yeah. Hmm. Every time I look at the tea bag, I think of my uncle. How's that? Well, he said his great-grandmother was at the Boston Tea Party. She was the first bag they threw overboard. <laughs> Don't let that cool a minute. Okay. How I ought to tell you? story about uh, old kale, I guess. Let me start out with another character. Orrin Pendleton was second assistant engineer on Fleischmann's yacht, the Camargo. And that was one of the few yachts that stayed in commission during the Depression. So he went on world, world tour. <coughs> They were tied up in Newport News for overhaul one fall. So Oren didn't have too much to do. He took a train over to Washington to see his brother Homer. Well, of course, they had to do the sites, <coughs> which included the Washington Monument, and uh, looked it all over, rode up inside, looked down, so on. And, uh, Homer asked uh, Oren, uh, what do you think of that? It's quite a pinnacle, ain't it? Uh, yep. Yeah. He said, probably if old Kale could have had that to practice on, he'd have learned to fly. <laughs> well, he said, what are you talking about? Well, he said, you know old Kale, the next door neighbor back home, Maine? Oh, yes. Well, he thought he could fly. So he spent all one winter whittling out a pair of wings. Come spring, he climbed up on the barn, and jumped off the tie-up with his wings, but he hit the ground pretty hard. Someone asked him what the trouble was. He said, well, he didn't have too much time to practice on the way down. <laughs> now, if he could have started from the Washington Monument, He'd had considerable time to practice, and he probably would have learned to fly. <laughs> Didn't have time to practice. <laughs> There's a lot of stories about people falling off barns. Uh, does it happen that often? I, I've only known of it really happening maybe a couple of times. There's a lot of stories about it. Well, like the old fellow that was 90-odd years old that fell off the barn roof. And you know the old story that when you're going to die, your whole life goes flashes before your eyes. Well, they drug him in the house, and he was he was pretty near unconscious, but he was in and out of consciousness. They determined that he was all right. So somebody said to him, just as an afterthought, they said, John, tell me, when you fell off that roof like that, did your whole life pass before your eyes? He says, oh, Lord, no, I only fell 10 feet. <laughs> <laughs> Probably enough time for 90 years to goodbye, I suppose. 
seems though most of these stories have been about <coughs> the coast and seafaring, so I'll have to tell you one about uh, woods work, logging. And this took place back in the days before chainsaws and skidders and such things. Men went to work in the woods then with uh, axes. An axe now, uh, never seen the woods except maybe a split a little kindling wood, something like that. Mm. Well, these two fellows were <coughs> working together one cold morning in January. They had each fallen on a tree and there was each limb in. Of course, they had double bitted axe, axes, kept them just like razors. They were each limbing on a separate tree about 20 feet apart. One fella got a little snow on his chopping mitts, kind of glazed over a little bit and made a slippery handle of the ax. So he took a healthy swipe at this limb, overstruck, the handle snapped out of his hands, the ax flew across this intervening space and hit his buddy right in the neck. Sliced his head off, just as clean as a whistle. Well, the fellow threw the ax, he felt kind of bad about it. In fact, they're both dead. Oh, yeah. But uh, he hurried over and grabbed his head and stuck it back on his neck, and patted a little snow, made a collar, a snow collar around it, and seemed to work pretty good. The fellow blinked a little bit and felt a little dizzy, he said, but aside from that, he was all right. So they kept on working the rest of the morning. And they was quite handy to the cookhouse. So uh, they went into dinner, walked into the cook shack. Well, it was hot in the, in the cook shack. And this uh, collar of snow we had around his neck began to melt a little bit and kind of loosen up. Well. <clears throat> He put quite a charge of pepper on his beans and got some of it up his nose and made him sneeze. And when he sneezed, his head snapped off, rolled across the camp floor, and hit a hemlock knot over by the ram down, killed him dead on the pump handle. <laughs> well, I always say most accidents happen in the home. <laughs> That is hot. Now, old Captain Les Rollison was a retired blue water sailor. He used to work summers down at the local yacht club for the summer people. One summer, there was a uh, summer resident by the name of Colonel Green. And he and Captain Les took a sort of a mild dislike to each other. Seems that Colonel Green's title was honorary, and Captain Les knew it. So he wouldn't call him Colonel Green, or just Mr. Green. So in retaliation, Colonel Green wouldn't call him Captain Rollison, or just Mr. Rollison. Well, this was sort of a harmless little affair. Went on for a while. I should interject here that uh, at this time in our island, no motor vehicles were permitted. Uh, if you wanted uh, transportation, you either had an old horse or a bicycle or you walked. Well, <clears throat> one late afternoon, Captain Les was jogging on home up this little crooked billy goat trail they call the road, which led from the yacht club up to the main town road. And on one of the sharp corners, he met Colonel Green coming in. Well, since neither one of them was inclined to give an inch, they locked wheels on the corner. And there they sat, three feet from each other, glaring. Colonel Green was the first to see the uh, humor of the situation, so he grinned, reached under the cushion, pulled out a pint of old Medford rum, passed it over, Captain Les, and then it was Captain Les turn to grin. So he tapped it and passed it back. Well, now the situation developed. 
so that it really required deliberation. It was one of these situations you couldn't rush into. It needed uh, science and uh, logistics and time and motion study. So while they were going through all this deliberation, while well, the pint was going back and forth over the front wheel, well, after a half an hour, the pint was empty, so there weren't any point in sitting there in the middle of the road any longer. So they each backed up a couple of steps and cleared their wheels and drove off the best of friends. Colonel Green was now a brigadier general, <laughs> and Captain Les was a retired admiral in the United States Navy. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> on the way home, jogging along in the glow of the sunset, and perhaps a little bit from the old Medford, Captain Les began thinking about uh, the old horse he'd been driving for these many years, and the fact that perhaps he hadn't appreciated the value of this horse. He'd been pretty faithful. And furthermore, he didn't think the uh, neighbors appreciated the value of this horse. And it was time that he did something about it. So he knew the store would be full of, full of men at this time of day, going home from work. So he thought he would show the men at the store what the old horse could do. Well, he had been a fourth-rate mudder on some of the uh, dirt tracks of Maine many, many years before. But the idea of trying to show a little speed was so foreign that it took quite a bit of urging to get the idea across. But when he got near the store, he had uh, shaken the old horse out pretty well. And <clears throat> when he really got the idea, he responded with a will. It surprised Captain Les, in fact, surprised the horse himself. So when he was passing the store, the old wa rag wagon was rattling. Uh, Gravel was tattooing on the dasher. Old Captain Les had reins in one hand and his white yachting cap in the other, you know, and see I go. Well, it emptied the store. Everyone couldn't imagine what in the world was going on. But it didn't last. The horse soon slowed to a walk. The fire was out. And he turned up his long driveway up over Rebel Hill to his home where he lived. There was an entryway built on the kitchen end of the house, and the barn was out behind, so you had to go around the entryway. Well, either by design or intent, old Captain Les missed the road and put the old horse up over the steps into the entryway. <laughs> well, he got his <coughs> front feet on the top step, and his head and neck in the entryway, he couldn't go any further because the end of the field was brought up on the door jam. <laughs> Aunt Ella was in the kitchen, and she heard the commotion, and she opened the kitchen door, and here was a horse's head blowing in a puffin right in her face. <laughs> and she peeked out round, you know, took the scene in in one glance. She said, oh, Leslie, what a state you're in. <laughs> now, now, dearie. I allow us how I may, may be a mite off course, but my God, they ain't shifted states on me, have they? <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of the story that is attributed to Abraham Lincoln. You may have heard the story that uh, he was quite a humorist, you know. I'm sure. He told a story about this fellow that uh, was a little mite timid, and he'd rented this hoss, and apparently the hoss was pretty frisky. So he got on the, the saddle there, and the hoss, he starts jumping and kicking. And in the process, see, the fellow wasn't all settled down yet. And in the process of hoss jumping and kicking, he got his own hind foot in one of the stirrups, got it hung up. The fellow looked down, and he jumped off, and he said to the hoss, he says, now that's it. If you're getting on, I'm getting off. <laughs> Joe Robinson lived on the <coughs> little hard scrabble farm back in the county roadways. He didn't get to town very often, but he'd uh, come in once in a while, old beat-up beat pickup truck. 
and uh, swap eggs and butter, a few chickens occasionally for, for the necessaries of life at the store. And he would get caught up on the, on the local happenings out in the clearings. Well, he came in one day and he said, uh, Anything new this week, Rolf? He said, yep. He said, uh, Ed Beckett got killed. Ed got killed. Well, I'll be doggone. Ain't that too bad? Poor old Ed. Well, uh, what happened? Well, he said his horse ran away, ran up over the stone wall, threw Ed out, put his head through the wagon wheel, broke his neck. Gee, Jerusalem, poor old Ed. Said, yep, had to cut his head off to get him clear. Cut his head off? Why, Godfrey Diamond, why didn't they saw a spoke out the wheel? Oh, they couldn't do that. Well, that was almost a brand new wagon. <laughs> I spoke of the uh, many sea captains and seafaring men in town, which was true all up along the coast, back a couple of generations. Nowadays, when uh, you see these pretty pictures of uh, sailing vessels under full sail, look very beautiful, and they're supposed to be romantic, all of that. Mm -hmm. Certain amount of nostalgia goes with it. But actually, it, it, was, a, it was a hard life. Uh, a working vessel, the uh, living conditions were pretty rough, food was poor, uh, work was dangerous and hard. And it was just monotonous many times. It was long, monotonous voyages. If it hadn't been for the pets, which uh, the sailors often acquired, it would have been even more monotonous. But uh, you no know, one of these vessels, they had a, uh, the captain had a parrot, the mate had a monkey. And, of course, they had the run of the whole vessel, and they were great pets of all the crew, relieved the monotony, all the antics they would go through. But uh, one thing they had to remember, that they hated each other with a passion. So they could only let one out at a time, and the other one had to be put in the cage. Well, this particular voyage had been monotonous, and it's slow, they'd got becalmed for a couple of weeks. And of course, when they finally made port, well, they were very anxious to get ashore. So, uh, long about midnight, the captain looked over at the mate. He said, by God, he brought his hand down on the mahogany, you know, and said, we didn't put that monkey away and the parrot was out when we left. Well, the captain says, too late now. Can't do much about it, and says. So he raised his cup, and he says, here's to the monkey, and here's to the parrot. He heisted her twice. Well, he got back home along the wee morning hours, and uh, the cabin was a shambles. Oh, it was awful. Papers and charts and uh, all sorts of materials all over the floor. Bunk was all torn to pieces, blankets disarrayed, chairs knocked over, blood and hair and feathers all over everything. It was a mess. Well, he started cleaning up slowly. Felt pretty sorrowful. He heard a little scratching way over in the dark corner under the bunk. And he listened, and the scratching came again. And pretty soon, out from the bunk, way as, in as far as he could get, the parrot had been hiding, and he came out, staggered out from under the bunk. 
and he was a mess too. He'd missed all of his tail feathers. One wing was dragging. One eye was buttoned up tight. And he was blood and hair all over. He was, he was a sorry looking bird. But he staggered out into the middle of the floor, tried, tried to take a sight up on the captain. He lost his balance and tumbled over. Got to his, dragged to his feet again, braced himself with his good wing. Ah! Looked up, took another bearing on the captain. Said, Captain, we've had one hell of a squall. <laughs> North of Bangor, as you well know, a uh, whole series of small towns uh, backed up along the river, mostly. Uh, back a while ago, before uh, there was so much concern about environmental pollution and all of that sort of thing, many of the householders had their outhouses perched along this high, one of the towns, uh, high bluff backed up the river. Very convenient. And of course, naturally, one Halloween, why some of the some of these outhouses got tipped into the river. Oh yeah. Well, the next morning, uh, one of the residents nailed his ten year old and uh, said, Willie, uh, you know, our outhouse got tipped in the river last night. Uh, do you know anything about it? Oh no, no father, no. Me and Charlie were over town all evening. Well, now, Willie, I have pretty good reason to believe that you know something about this. Now, you sure? You sure you don't know? No, no. Uh, me and Charlie uh, spent all evening rigging a tic tac on the minister's house. Well, now, Willie, you've heard about George Washington and the fact that uh, he couldn't tell a lie. Now, when George Washington was a little boy, he wanted a hatchet very badly. So he uh, saved up box tops till he got uh, 1,379 box tops, and he sent them in to Sears Roebuck. And in due time, they sent back this new shiny hatchet with a handle painted red. And young George was so tickled that he went outdoors and he slayed the first tree he came to. It happened to be his father's prized cherry tree. So when his father got home from the uh, weekly poker game and he found his prized cherry tree horizontal instead of vertical, he was very unhappy. And he asked George about it, his uh, son, uh, Something happened to our cherry tree. Do you know anything about it? And young George said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. He said, I cut it with my shiny new hatchet with a handle painted red. Well, his father patted him on the head and called him a good boy and took him in the house and gave him some milk and cookies. Now, Willie, wouldn't you like to, like to grow up and be a great man like George Washington? He was uh, first president of the United States. He was father of his country. He was commander in chief of the Continental Armies. Well, now, father, I'm not so sure. He said, let's take these one at a time. As far as being president, uh, presidents haven't been doing so hot lately. I think it'd be a lot more fun to, uh, to work over in Uncle Waldron's sawmill now, as far as father in the whole countryside, uh, I'll admit that does have a certain appeal, but uh, that's taken in quite a lot of territory for a young fellow like me. Uh, maybe we could settle first for a couple of counties. Now, as far as being commander in chief of the uh, Continental Armies, I guess, uh, I guess George Washington did all right, but he did pull a couple of capers that uh, I never thought were too smart. 
Now take that idea of him uh, crossing the Delaware and standing up in the rowboat. Why, gee whiz, Father, uh, any but private in the rear ranks knows better than to stand up in the rowboat. But of course, uh, I understand that he did have a lot on his mind. And he was waiting for the uh, rationale for this battle to come through from the Continental Congress. And the mail's been awful slow that winter. I think George was standing up in the rowboat still looking for that mailman. Of course, if he didn't have the rationale, well, he couldn't type out the criteria. Five copies, all signed in quintip quintuplet. Uh, if he didn't have the rationale, if he didn't have the criteria, I think he must have fought the whole battle of Trenton just working on general guidelines. But anyway, Father, if you say that George Washington became a great man because he was always telling the truth, perhaps I will admit that maybe I helped uh, Charlie just a little bit kind of easy in that outhouse into the river. Whereupon his father grabbed him by the ear and took him into the woodshed and gave him a trimming. Well, he was kind of blundering around, blubbering around afterwards. And uh, he said, there's something wrong here, father. He said, now when George Washington told his father that he cut down the cherry tree, his father patted him on the head and called him a good boy and took him in the house and gave him some milk and cookies. Now, when I tell you that uh, I just helped Charlie just a little bit, kind of ease our outhouse into the river, I get a trim in for telling the truth. Now, there's, there's something wrong here, Father. Well, he thought he had his father for a minute, and then his father said, yes, son, but there's just one big difference. When George Washington cut down the cherry tree, his father was not up in the branches. <laughs> you know, a lot of good fun was taken away from the country boys when they started putting that plumbing inside the house. But I'll tell you something, in weather like this, I'm glad mine is inside.